Hello and good morning, everyone. I'm Leslie Shi, and I am one of the co-chairs of the CSDMS Terrestrial Working Group. Uh, I'm here today hosting this presentation on FAIR and research software. I'd like to just give brief presentations of our two presenters before I let them take it away. We'll be hearing from Dr. Anna Lena Lamprecht. She's an assistant professor in the Software Technology Group, Department of Information and Computing Sciences in Utrecht University, Netherlands. Anna Lena conducts research at the interface of research software engineering and applied formal methods. She's currently focusing on FAIR software and automated composition of scientific workflows and also teaches courses on programming, software engineering, and formal methods in her department's study programs and beyond. She's a Westerdijk Fellow, Faculty Ambassador of the Open Science Community Utrecht, and Co-Founder and Steering Committee Member of the award-winning Women in Information and Computing Sciences Network. We also have Dr. Salvador Capella. He is Group Leader of the Spanish National Bioinformatics Coordination Node at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center in Spain. Salvador's current focus is on the development of long-term infrastructures to facilitate the scientific benchmarking and technical monitoring of bioinformatics tools, web services, and workflows in the context of Elixir, which is a pan-European distributed organization across 22 countries and more than 250 institutions. In the context of Elixir, Salvador co-leads the Elixir Tools platform, which aims for better software development across the life sciences. So welcome very much to these two presenters, and I'm going to uh, disappear here and enjoy your presentation. Thanks for the introduction, Leslie, and again, also for, for the invitation. So I'll, I'll start this off and Salva will... Uh, yeah, jump in <laughs> in a while, yeah. and then so we'll 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 change back and forth a bit. So yeah, fair and research software indeed a quite uh, hot topic, I would say. Um, it's on it's also currently a very fast moving field. So every time that we give this presentation, we adapt it a bit to account for the latest developments. And yeah, the idea for this presentation is a bit to shortly recap the FAIR data principles, because that is where all the discussion started and that most people know, but just for the context of the presentation, we will do a small interactive recap with you so that you have clear in your mind at this morning again um, uh, what this is about. And then we will discuss a bit, okay, data and software, what are actually the differences and why do we need separate principles for software or why do we say we need different principles for software and then we'll discuss a bit about the different steps in the journey towards fair principles for research software that we have already taken uh, the, the outcome so far and we will also mention yeah, a few pointers to the international community around the topic that has formed and what you can do to get involved if you're interested in because there's also many different ways to 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 take part and take part in this journey Right, so maybe you're familiar with this Mentimeter uh, tool. Uh, so I would invite you to just grab your phone or another browser window or whatever, go to menti.com and type in that code that you see on the slide there and answer our first question that is simply the FAIR data principles. How familiar are you with those? So have you heard about them at least? That would maybe be somewhat. If this is really the first time you hear about FAIR, that will be a no. And if you have yeah, bothered or worried a bit about FAIR already, then please choose uh, choose yes. Yeah, so FAIR, uh, while you're answering, I'm just uh, talking about that a bit. <laughs> it's this acronym for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. This idea that all research data and in fact, all research objects should be these four things. Yeah? Findable in the internet, accessible without um, really limitations, or at least it should be clear how to assess them. They should be interoperable, so be able to be integrated with, with each other. And in the spirit of science, of course, also reusable, so that people can um, yeah, make use of the research outputs that other people have already produced and do not have to do it themselves. 
Yeah, so I see that most people here say yes, or even somewhat. Only one person says no, never heard of this before. But then, um, yeah, unfortunately, we can't do a full introduction to, to that topic here. But I think the most important thoughts for FAIR software will become clear also without that. So the next four questions are a kind of uh, quiz um, checking how familiar you are really with the FAIR data principles. And the way it works, so I have a, have a statement and then you need to say which of the four principles, so F, A, I, or R that is. And let's see how that goes. I think you need to enter some, some player name maybe first before we can answer this question. So we have some, some players here. Um, yeah, and so we have question uh, one of four. You should be able to see it now. Yes. So metadata are assigned a globally unique and persistent identifier. So is this findable, accessible, interoperable, or reusable? A globally unique and persistent identifier for a paper can be a DOI, for example. So this digital object identifier or another like persistent URL that are given by large databases. That is what's meant by a by a persistent identifier. So now, which which principle is this? Uh, time's up. See, yeah, findable, and that's correct. So most of you guessed this correctly. That's that's very nice, um, and that's also a very clear one. That maybe as a spoiler at this point, this applies to both software and data. So this is a very important principle indeed. Okay, next question. Let's see if that's a bit more difficult. Question two or four is metadata meets the main relevant community standards. So which principle talks about community standards and domain relevant standards? This is a bit of a more difficult one. <laughs> Ten seconds left to answer. Right, time's up. And this is interoperability. And no, I mean, and, and it always works. We always trap people with this one, and it's a bit mean one. So this principle, if you if you go to the uh, the original fair paper, this one is listed under reusability. And the point here is really like the domain uh, relevant. Um, community standard and community. This is very much about what allows people to reuse and, and uh, research object. That is, the idea is that this has a lot to do with like the domain specific information that is provided. And it's, it's arguably it has to do with interoperability as well. This is also why many people choose it. Um, but the the emphasis here and the principles it's in it's in reusable. Um, yeah, and interoperability has meant much more to do with really formals and technicalities than it has with uh, domains and communities. But yeah, we'll dive a bit deeper into that a bit later. Next quiz question, three out of four, is another sentence. So metadata are retrievable by their identifier using a standardized communications protocol. Which one is this? Findable, accessible, interoperable, or reusable? Five seconds left. Everyone has voted. This is accessible. Yes, most of you are right. Yeah? And so this standardized communications protocol can, for example, be HTTP or something. So that means you could just download that stuff through the browser. That is an old, yeah, standardized and open communications protocol. And that's very, uh, very important as well. OK, last of this series of quiz questions is now yeah, metadata include qualified references to other metadata. Which one is this? Again, 30 seconds to answer.
10 seconds. Yeah, this is really one of the difficult principles. That's what I can already say. And that sparks, as well as for data, as for software, a lot of discussion. Interoperable, indeed. So maybe you just figured, because we didn't have this one yet, maybe it really sounded like interoperability, but this is indeed correct. And the idea is, yeah, references between objects that has a lot to do with interoperability, of course. Well, thanks for uh, your answers on this one. Let me see if we can get to the next bit. Right. It was a bit slow computing, but we do have a leaderboard for the quiz. So agent X9, no idea who it was, but was the fastest and the best in this. But you have been doing quite well, everybody. So this is quite a good, quite a new, uh, quite a good result. Okay, we will have a few more uh, Mentimeter interactions with you, but not in the kind of a quiz, but more of a discussion, but maybe keep that, uh, keep your mobile uh, ready or your browser window open, you will need it again. Yeah, so very quickly, th so this is what FAIR is about. You seem to have a quite good idea about that. And yeah, they have, the they have been tremendously popular in, in the last years, but they have actually only proposed like five years ago in 2016 uh, by Mark Wilkinson and, and, and others. And yeah, this original paper is mentioned here on top of the slides. And what you see there is that really that original paper talks about the fair guiding principles for scientific data management and stewardship. And this is this prominent title and the way the paper was uh, framed and you know, also led to the FAIR principles being perceived and uh, communicated mainly for data in the beginning. Although from the start, and that's also the original paper, they were meant for yeah, all kinds of research output, at least digital research output. Yeah? And, and, and this is like a, a quote from a European Commission paper that also names, for example, data, software, and other research resources that should also be FAIR. And yeah, the starting point of our work was then, uh, not five years, but like three and a half years ago or so, to say, okay, how do we now resolve that mismatch? Yeah, so actually the FAIR principles are meant for all research objects, but then the, these really popular, famous principles talk about data so much. Um, let's have a look at that, what that really means. How do, you, do these FAIR principles really relate to software? And yeah, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's an, an ongoing discussion. There is not yet a set of definite FAIR principles for software, um, but the paper that, that Salva and I and a bunch of other people published, um, yeah, officially spring uh, last year, uh, I think it, it definitely was a milestone in this discussion and it summarized some of the important thoughts why we need um, separate FAIR principle for, for software. And indeed, yeah, proud to say it was most viewed article in that journal in the first half of last, last year. And what we will do in the following is also next to get into some of the thoughts and ideas in, in that paper to understand a bit more what the discussion is about. So here's the next Mentimeter question for you, open question. Um, and just type in your answers to this. What is actually data? When we talk about the difference of data and software, we first should get the terms clear. I'm curious to see what comes in here. Yeah, first answer in recorded information. And there's not, I mean, answer what, what comes to your mind because there's not really a right or wrong because there's certainly different uh, definitions for data and they can all be, and they can all be correct. Observations and measurements, observations again, information in its rawest form. That's a phrasing that I like. <laughs> Measured values of phenomena. We have, let's see what else we get. Information in communicable form. Numerical or other forms. Yeah, that talks about the types of the things a bit. Yeah, but we do see a lot of like information um, that is recorded, measurements, facts, um, that we can do something with, uh, recorded information again. Okay, I mean, I don't disagree with, with any of these. I mean, they're all uh, good uh, composition, but let's see like what the other things are uh, that we talk about. So this is data. 
Um, then, then what is software? Well, interesting, because this is often people find this more difficult to to answer. thinking i'm waiting for the first replies yes there's one computer code written to accomplish a purpose for sure i can agree with that <laughs> code applied to data yeah code often i mean software often applies to data um computer code composed in a human readable programming language uh, we, we could probably discuss about human readability but yeah computer code in a programming language makes sense as a definition for software code packages and performing some operations, tool built to support a process, sometimes data collection, yeah, methodology, that's a quite abstract view, but certainly not, not wrong. Software tools based on a computer perform specific tasks, perhaps involving the use and output of data, but not necessarily. Yeah, but the most interesting programs do something with data <laughs> input and output. Actually, scientific software, set of equations, yeah, to mimic a process. Computer started and receive digital information, perform tasks. Yeah, so what, what you all capture here in a, a sense really that software does something, it's executable, dynamic, and that it might do that on data input. Not necessarily, I mean, you could run simulations, for example, without really having input, like starting a simulation from in itself, but most computer programs have some kind of input and produce some kind of output. And there you see the difference between like data being a bit uh yeah a different kind of digital object right so next question um based on this so what do data and software have in common we listed a couple of things what they are but if you look at the data and software maybe also on your computer where are they kind of the same Software is data. Yeah, that's an interesting quote that often comes, and I will comment on that uh, a bit later. Uh, both are part of a scientific process. Yeah, in this time and age, that's that's for sure. They're used together to solve problems. Yeah, I mean, data alone would maybe not be so useful. They're stored on a computer. Yeah, and for software, in some sense, that was. Yeah, always the case, punch cards could also be data, but I mean, data can also be recorded on paper, of course, in principle. Well, nowadays, that's not so much the case anymore. Both are forms of information. Yeah, they exist in digital form. They must have standards, that's also a good one. Support research outputs that are very valuable. Yes, although I sometimes uh, have the feeling that people value data more than software. So. That's a bit of a cultural change that needs to happen. Data have input and output that is related to software. Software is a computational engine to use data. Yeah. Yeah, they have interpreted language both. Yeah, you need to learn to read both of them. Nice. So there's interesting answers. And maybe you could expect that after this question of what they have in common, the next question is what makes them actually different? And we can have the quote again of software as data. And as I said, I will comment on that in a, in, a, in a moment. But what else is different? Yeah, software without data aren't so useful for science, that's true, but also data without software is usually not of too much use, yeah. Data are not executable. That's an important one, in my opinion. Software needs data to work, certainly for scientific software. How they accumulate. Yeah, software may be rerun many times and data observations aren't repeated exactly. In most of cases, that's true, yeah. So data are often more, indeed, more and more static. Once you have recorded data sets, uh, they, are, they are there, although you might, of course, run measurements again. Yeah. 
and data doesn't change and software can be versioned. Yeah, I mean, there's also the concept of versions for, for data, but it's much less exposed, that's true. Data is understandable using metadata. Software can't understand using metadata itself. Well, that's maybe debatable. <laughs> there's also metadata for software, but I agree that it's, again, more developed for, for data, especially in the, all the fair data work that has been done. Yeah. They require different knowledge to create, implement document. Uh, yes, so this procedural and computational thinking that is required for programming is certainly different kind of skill sets than what you need for collecting data. Yeah, and last year, data is independent of a function, execution, yeah, that comes with the software, different expertise, data represents and software instructs. Yeah, so very nice differences and all observations really good. So maybe like a comment from uh, that I that I promised to do to do. So this the statement of software is data or software is not data. So and that is a statement uh, that you often hear. So people say software is just a special kind of data. Um, and in some sense, that's true. And um, especially when you look at maybe what people have learned in their basic computer science classes at, at some point. But that is a, yeah, as, as depicted here on the top of the slide, uh, a very technical view. And that says, okay, in a, in a computer system, everything at the end of the day, everything that we store is represented in sequences of ones and zeros. That's what we call data. And that can be then in the computer information, but also instructions and software and whatever else. Yeah, and, and in that perspective, we would say software is a special kind of data. Um, so that's not wrong, but we found that in the context of discussing about FAIR and software, that this perspective is just not very helpful. And um, because it's a, it's a level of granularity where FAIR is actually not operating. So FAIR is much more on a domain specific researcher level. And there, so FAIR talks about the, the digital object, about the being like the, the superclass, the parent, and as children of that, we do have data and software, but next to each other. And it means that they share, as you have also identified, different properties. Yeah, for example, also to have, they can both be assessed, uh, yeah, assigned a DOI for identification, but then, yeah, software is executable, and that comes, for example, with more dependencies, which data doesn't have, so it needs a different treatment there. So this was more, more the picture that we take for the discussion of uh, of the FAIR principles for, for research software. Right, so um, maybe some other points about research software. So what is this term actually? And um, yeah, there's again a working group working on a, on a clear definition of what is research software and what is not research software, um, because there are some edge cases for which it's not, not so clear, but for, for the sake of here, just let's just say that any software that is used to generate process and analyze results that you, yeah, that you do in a research context that you intend to appear in a publication is certainly research software. Um, but without sticking to this one um, definition so much, you can certainly say that research software comes in many forms for many purposes across many diff distribution channels. And much of, open, uh, of research software traditionally has been created as free or open source software. So that's this FOSS term. And um, an interesting thing in the FAIR software discussion is the relationship between FAIR and FOSS. Uh, because you can see there's a clear overlap of objectives. Yeah? So we want to make things available to other people and uh, make, make science more open and transparent and connected. Um, but yeah, but FOSS is very much about open source code and open licenses uh, to do that. Where when you look at FAIR, the yeah, open data is really not a requirement. And that's uh, in the FAIR data discussion for good reasons, because uh, yeah, data is often privacy or privacy sensitive. For example, when you look at uh, health records uh, or other personal data, but then, so that makes sense, but then these concerns are not valid in the same way for software, yeah? because software are instructions, methods that you should share um, with others in a good scientific practice. And, yeah, this separate from the data. So yeah, so why not share the software that could be a demand for open? And um, as I said, it's an ongoing discussion, but I would like to hear your opinion. Like should FAIR for software um, require software to, yeah, to have an open license? Huh? 
and that would be then differ from the fair data principles, or should it be in line with the fair data principles and say, no, it doesn't have to be open, but it just need to be clear what the access conditions are. So just feel free to fire whatever comes to, to your mind here. So first answer in is a yes of the principle of accessibility. I must say I don't have a have a clear opinion on that yet. I can uh, really find arguments for both positions. Yeah? So the next second answer in is indeed a no, because sometimes you are constrained to use of some specific software that is not open. Yeah, and it would be, be a shame if you cannot make your own software open just because you depend on that. Yeah. Open license by default, exceptions allowable. That's a compromise suggestion. Yeah. In some cases, it would be a benefit. Yes, it's a default. Yeah, I mean, I also certainly think that um, fair for software should encourage open uh, open licensing, but maybe it's difficult to enforce. Yeah, both are an integral part of open science. Yeah, the data are open source. Yeah, so what fair does enforce though is that you clearly state the conditions for access. Um, something like data will be provided on reasonable request or something and then you just decide if you like that person or not i mean that's not in the spirit of fair it needs to be very clear what the conditions are yeah that's also saying here strong recommendations for open software that's good um but maybe not not enforcing at all will multiple way to execute a program that's also a good point yeah you could also provide a uh, program as a service without uh, open sourcing it, but then people might make the argument, okay, but but if you don't offer that service anymore, what can people do with it? Okay, I'll leave it at that because it can be a very lengthy discussion, but just to give you an impression of the things that we are talking about. Um, another interesting uh, thing that we're talking about usually is the relationship between fair and software quality. Because this fair software discussion was, of course, picked up in the International Research Software Engineering RSE community a lot. And people are immediately worried about like good software. Yeah? So fair is, is one principle. What does all, fair also make helping software better? Can it meet those expectations? And there was a lot of like back and forth. I know this is like uh, this is fair, but this has to do with software quality or these kinds of software quality uh, do not have to do anything with fair. And we kind of managed to resolve that this conflict by distinguishing between the form and the function of the software. Yeah? And form meaning yeah, the, the way in which it is provided, like how the code looks, uh, the thing that you can download in a way, the artifact that you get. Um, and it is also to do with code quality, maintainability, things that you can, you can basically assess by looking at the source code. And these things, um, we found can be covered by these FAIR principles yeah? because you can define standards and evaluating that it has to do with how things are provided. And then there are things like functionality of the software. So that means things you can observe when the software is executed. Uh, if it's, uh, you can test if it's functionally correct, if it's secure, computational efficiency, these kind of things. Um, and that is not covered. Uh, by FAIR. And this is also not the intention of FAIR. And you see that when you consider the FAIR principles for data again, um, that's also not the case. So FAIR is really not about the content, but it's, it's about the form in which something is provided. And yeah, it means in an extreme case, you could have scientifically completely rubbish data that can be yeah, provided in a completely FAIR way. And that could be the same for software. Yeah, The software does complete nonsense. Yeah? completely faulty an analysis of something computationally super inefficient, but you can you can provide it in a completely fair way. And so this is a bit the, the difference. Um, yeah, this is another discussion, discussion question. So um, the and this question is now about fair data and software. So fair does not talk about the quality of the content, but should it or should it not? Is it good that it doesn't or should it rather? also make demands on I don't know, certain levels of quality, of scientific quality of the things that are provided. Again, curious to hear your opinions.
<laughs> there is no queue in fair. That's a that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. So another no, I'm not a computer scientist, but the code I write works for my analysis, even if it isn't pretty. Yeah. No, that's a different issue. Another no, yeah, because different scientific fields have different standards. Quality may be described as a part of metadata, yeah. Or you say quality is included implicitly because of reviews, yeah, that could be a point. Tangential, but knowing your code is used by others may improve its quality. That's true, that might be a psychological effect that people, before they publish, pay a bit more attention to, to make it good, yeah. And no, because the structural conformance that helps the main specific reviews assess more quality easily. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a bit of like a tendency into no, should not be a principle, but maybe things like that can be recorded in, in the metadata. Yeah. And I think personally think um, it would kind of be nice to also ensure more content quality um, for both data and software, but the fair principles are not the right mechanism for, for doing that, probably. Yeah. Thanks. So there was. Um, yeah, we're not able to present you the fair, def definite fair principles um, today, but I mean, this gave you hopefully a bit of a, an impression what this discussion is about. So meanwhile, and this has been like after we published this paper, a uh, international fair for research software, fair for RS uh, working group has formed. So jointly convened as an RDA working group, Force 11 working group and research software alliance task force. Um, yeah, you find it under on, on the, the URL that is given on the slide and you also, that's one way to get involved, you can still join the working group and the discussions. And the very recent outcome of that working group is actually the first draft of a yeah, set of community agreed fair principles for research software. So that was presented at the recent RDA plenary and just copy it in a, in a slide here. So as I said, it's, it's a draft, it's not the definite thing. Um, and I also don't want to go through all these points here, but what you can maybe see that many of the principles, so the, the shape stays kind of the same. So we um, are able to transfer the uh, fair data principles to software in most of the cases by just adapting it a slightly bit. Often it's just really replacing uh, data by software. Um, in some other cases, we need to make some small uh, extensions to better capture the, the properties of uh, software. For example, for the findability with the persistent identifiers for software, it's important that these identifiers assign also supports versions, yeah, which is possible for data, but not so much required. Yeah, and then we have other principles which are rephrased a bit more and that certainly also require more discussion. But yeah, the, this is the first draft. It will now be released for community consultation. So, and again said, so if you're interested in discussing this more, what should really be fair principles in the future, this is a good moment to join, to join the working group. Yeah, another ongoing discussions that has to do with the, um, uh, with all the principles, of course, is metrics, because at, at some point we need also to find out if we ask people to make software fair, we also somehow need to assess how fair things are. And at this point, I will hand over to uh, Salva, because he has been one of the first uh, people to work on metrics, even before the uh, fair for working group has started to discuss metrics as well. And yeah, I'm, I'm just slipping, uh, skipping through your slides, so just let me know when I should go to the next ones. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Thank you, Annalena. Uh, so far, I wanted to participate in the whole discussion, but then we can have, you know, two, three hours conversation, rather than the very limited time that we have for this presentation. So the question is, we have all these uh, uh, conceptual discussions, what about fair, fair for software and so on, but then we want to know how fair uh, is uh, the software that we're using, I uh, would say, every day. So what we decided in Open Events uh, was to look at the individual performance, individual metrics for, for, for software, but also to have a, a sort of a, an observatory to detect or to identify patterns or trends of the, how the community is developing uh, software. Where shall we put the focus? Because maybe there are aspects that they are not being taken care of or the people is not aware of that. So we have um, open events, the, the technical monitoring, where we look at both individual tools and then at the whole uh, population uh, uh, tools. 
when we're looking, when we're saying whole population of tools, we're talking about roughly 21, 22,000 tools. Every day we're computing at another of metrics. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, so we have, or we have seen the, the, theory, the theoretical collective effort, the quality assessment framework. That is an ongoing activity and probably will keep going for, 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 for a low time because it's really uh, nice, but also difficult to <laughs> incorporate all the sensitivities and all, you know, the little uh, details into, into the principles. And then we have the, 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 the practical part, the technical part. Okay, so we have the principles. Once we have the principle, we can derive metrics. And then the question is how do we measure those metrics? So there are many metrics that can be associated to the fair for software. And we decided to start with a few of them and then present them to the community. So the community can say, okay, we, we like it, we don't like it, so we are open to criticism, uh, or how or what else we can, we can measure, right? So in that the infrastructure level, we are doing a ATL strategy, so the extractions and transformation and loading, we're generating matrix, and then we are also uh, having a platform to release those results. If we go to the next uh, slide, please. The, 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 the infrastructure, basically, what we do is we go to different sources that can be repositories like Bitbucket, GitHub, uh, registries like Bio.tools or um, platforms like Galaxy and others or Bioconda. And then we analyze the, the data, metadata that is available there. We do a process of integration and harmonization. And then once we have consolidated that, we start measuring the different metrics that have been agree with the, or derive from the community. Once we have those metrics, we um, process and visualize them at the individual and at the, at the, at the let's say, general level. If we move on to the next slide, please. So basically here, you have a graphical description of what we do. We, we start by looking at Bioconda, Bio.tools, GitHub, and Galaxy. For those that doesn't know, for instance, about Bio.tools, that probably is the most domain-specific resource, Bio.tools is a registry, a software registry where you can register your software and then you describe them uh, using ontologies. So uh, that favor that your software can be fine by people. No? And I want to find a software doing a specific thing, a specific function. So a good, a good place to go is uh, to, to a registry and look there, especially when you have that many, that many tools. So we query those resources. We bring um, the, the part of the metadata, the data, we are integrate, harmonize, and then we start complementing those resources. Looking, for instance, at the, the tools homepages, doing the, the journals as well. So we try to enrich the data that we have so we can have a better view of the software that we are looking at. And of course, then we go always to the analysis and visualization because we don't want to stop there. So we have to uh, done the hard work, and that's how to how to present that resources and how we can identify those uh, trends that I was mentioning before. So if we go to the next slide, please. And I'm just talking about very interesting results. So the, 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 the first one is about licensing. So you might think and before there was this discussion, you know, the open licenses or not or how to do it. So uh, you might think, oh, all the software has a license. And we have detected that that is not the case. So 60% of the software have no li license whatsoever. And if we are, um, let's say, if we play by the book, by the rules, software without license shouldn't be used because you don't know what about the software. Probably because we are researchers, so we are going to use the software and so on. But for instance, a company will not use software, will not incorporate that software into the processes because then they don't know what might happen if they use a software without licenses. Um, and the, the, there is people who assume that no license means open license, and that is not true. So open licenses, they have a, a number of things, a number of implications, and no license means that you cannot uh, make any, any assumption. So we have 60% of software without licenses, and then we have 38% of the software that is that have unambiguous licenses. But answer, why are we saying ambiguous, unambiguous licenses? Because it might happen that you have different versions and that might be major, minor, or you might have different deployments, or, or even you can have the software registered in different places. Like in GitHub, you have the 
the repository for the software and then you have the, the home page for the software. And sometimes happens that the, there is not the same license in, in, in two places. And then we, we are detecting those, those situations. Luckily for us, generally speaking, there is not uh, uh, many ambiguities in, in terms of licensing. So when we analyze the, the, how the licenses are, so we can see that most of them are open source, but not all of them. So 71% 70, of the software has a, a, an open source license. And if we go to the, to the next slide, you will see that the most popular ones is the GPL. So we have around 5,000 uh, instances uh, using GPL, then MIT, artistic, and so on and so forth. Here we decided to put together by families because we have, for instance, GPL one, two, three, and then you have different version uh, and small variants and so on and so forth. So we decided to uh, bring all together to analyze what is the general trend by, by the community. This 71% of the uh, software with uh, open, uh, open licenses. And it's important to, to, to identify this because then we see what is the tendency, where the community is moving. And because those, uh, those aspects are relevant for the uh, reusability and I would say for the interoperability as well. So I want to integrate my software, for instance, in a workflow. I want to, to use it and to, to, and to reuse it and to understand how to, how to do it. So we we'll move on to the next slide. Another aspect that for us is important is the version control. So because uh, I don't know if it happened to you, but it used to, to be that you get a, a binary and you cannot modify, you cannot have a look at the, at, the, at, the, at the functionality and so on. So the community has been moving from those early days to you know, nowadays the common practice is to have a repository with the code, but still not all the software is in a version control repository. When I'm saying a version control repository, I'm saying about GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, and Sigma. So then we see that 30% of the, the software is uh, using a version control. 63% of the software is, in a, is not using a version control. Of course, it will be interesting, and it's something that we're doing at the moment, is to see the historical evolution of that. Because here we are putting all the software. So my bet is like, New software tend to be in a version control uh, repository, while old software might be just the, the binary. And that can be also seen because when we were analyzing the different repositories, we saw that the, the predominant is GitHub. And then the second one is SourceForge. That to me tend to be quite popular a few years ago, like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, something like that. So that might be a reason that uh, still the community especially for all versions of the software has to move to this kind of uh, repository. And of course, this is relevant for the component of reusability. We want to know where is the software, where is the documentation, and so on and so forth, but also for the accessibility. Because I might find the software uh, using a, a, a registry or using Google, for instance, but then I want to access to that software. And if I don't have a way to access to that software using the standard protocols, then we have uh, problem. So those are the, the, the second aspect I wanted to introduce here. And if we go to the next uh, slide, I think it, this is my last one, if I'm not mistaken. But I just wanted to say that there are a number of recommendations for software that Annalena will explain uh, to, to all of us. <laughs> Thanks, Saiba. It's really cool to see the results of your work there. They're emerging. That's a yeah, well, there's more more to come about that. Yeah, one thing I wanted to mention here at this point is also these five recommendations for fair software um, published by the Netherlands eScience Center, which is really a radical, let's say, practical approach to fair. Because I mean, this as you saw before, the discussion around the really principles is still going on, and it can get quite academic because it's uh, we want to capture it completely and really do it well. And what the eScience Center is, so it's a it's a really yeah, center in the Netherlands supporting researchers to do software, they wanted to quickly release something that helps people to make their software better. So if, if your interest is not so much in, in defining these principles and understand them at a, at a broader academic or policy level, but just need to know what should I do, then this can be a very uh, good approach to do. And what they do on, on, on this website, fairsoftware.eu, is to have yeah, five fairly simple recommendations where they say, you, you can do this and then your software will be fairer. 
automatically, right? The, the first two, that's very nice because it also aligns with what Salva has just presented. So do put your code into public, publicly accessible repository with version control. Um, yeah, that's, that's both for, as Salva was, accessibility, usability, and also add a license. And the broad interpretation doesn't even have to be open source, but do as a, add a license so that people know under which condition they can use the software. And then the other three are register your code in a community registry. So Salva was briefly also talking about Biola tools, for example, which is a big registry, like a yellow pages phone book in, in the life science community. We will just, people will go when they search for certain functionality and then they will find the right tools for that. Um, yeah, enable citation of the software. There's also like different, different ways to do that, but let people know how they can cite you. So is there a paper associated with that that should be cited or can the software be cited directly? There's different ways to do that, but make that possible. And the fifth, I mean, it relates a bit to software quality, but this thing of using a software quality checklist that will take you through yeah, having formats, having documentations, uh, using the right standards, having the right metadata, these on and so forth. So have a look at that website if you're interested in really practical tips for uh, for making fair and uh, yeah about all these topics. There's lots of more information on the website. And the nice thing is, if your organization is convinced that yeah this is a good thing to do, um, you can also endorse this, and then you will appear on the on the website of uh, fair software endorsement organizations. Yeah, maybe on on that very last Mentimeter question to you these fair recommendations for um uh, yeah for research software i would be interested are you doing these things maybe already anyway uh, public repository license community registries citation software quality checklist is this something you have um yeah done before or are you doing or is it something oh never done this but maybe i should consider this applies of course to everybody here who who has software who writes software. All right, so an answer is in two. Uh, let's see if we see a similar pattern as often. Yeah, it seems a bit. So yeah, many people do the first two, and this is what we see very often, right? So many people use presumably GitHub, that's the most popular thing. Uh, people do provide licenses. Um, in many cases, also open source licenses make sense on GitHub. Um, but then usually the um, the other three are less exposed, and you're doing quite well here, and especially the um, enabling of citation of the software. But it's usually lower, so you're really doing, doing well on this one. That's very good to see. Yeah, but I think the community registries, they need to catch up a bit, and that's also very domain specific. Where, when, when there are already like really popular and uh, well-established community registries, people are of course more inclined to, to put their software there. Yeah, thanks for those answers. Um, and we are almost closing. What I wanted to also give you is a kind of yeah, a fair for software reading list. It's fairly incomplete, but this is maybe some of the um, yeah, kind of milestone papers or resources that have come out in the last years. Um, yeah, I will share the slides with the organizers so that they can share it with you. So you don't have to, to type it from, from the screen now. You can have them have them later. Um, yeah, and I think we just should acknowledge all the numerous people who contributed to all these discussions. And this is including you now, because from all of these presentations, we take something to the, to the ongoing discussions. And maybe you're even interested to join us in, in the working group. And yeah, with that, thanks for tuning in with us this morning in a seminar that has been at an earlier hour than usual, as I have learned. And yeah, maybe as a last remark, this picture is what you get when you use like Microsoft online office to create slides and you type in fair, then it's, it's starting to suggest pictures automatically. And then it had this like picture of this, <laughs> um, this like really fair uh, trade fair event. And I thought this was a very last nice illustrations for this like inter interesting journey towards uh, fair principles for research software yeah so thanks again for for tuning in and i think we can take questions and we have a bit of time for that
Great, thank you so much for that presentation. And you even got in some semantics there in the end with FAIR, so that's great, thank you. I uh, saw some things that were shared in the chat, thank you very much. And now we have time for questions. You can either type those in the chat or you can unmute yourself if you have a question for our presenters. I will start with one question um, that I had while people are thinking. Uh, on one of your slides, Annalena, you, um, the FAIR principles for software, it just caught my eye that there was one statement about the software should include something about associated provenance. Um, do you, no, and I was just wondering if you could say a few sentences about that to explain maybe to scientists who are writing code, like what would that entail to include associated provenance information? Yeah, I mean, I start, Salva can, can add, add, add to that. I mean, provenance is often, we, we mean by that also for data, like kind of recording the history of how something has come into being, right? And the rule for software, for me, so like, uh, yeah, what were the development steps? Also a bit of the change history, um, which parts from other projects have maybe contributed. So all that, all this, um, how the software has come into being is also transparent. Yeah, and then, but it's often like not completely clear in which form to record that. So that's also part of ongoing work. If there can really be provenance standards also for software. I mean, there has been more uh, work done on provenance of workflows and, and data um, but I think for software, it's not so clear yet what the standards are. Maybe Salva knows more. You're still mute. <laughs> okay, yes. I, yes, I was yeah. muted. No, I, I agree that hasn't, a lot of work hasn't been placed in, into the provenance for software, but to me, a very basic form of provenance is a repository like GitHub because you can trace all the transformation that the software has suffered, has suffered, has uh, uh, been under uh, over time. So you can understand what are the, the changes and so on and so forth. Great. That is a very clear answer that I think people can say, okay, if I'm using version control, that will um, go towards the provenance. I see a question in the chat. So what is the difference between general software management and fair software. You want to start, Salva? <laughs> yes. And I, uh, I, I can add, yeah. Uh, I, I will say that is a super interesting question. I haven't, uh, you know, reflect on that uh, enough. I will add you that uh, fair software is a component of the general software management, because when you think it, General software management covers many aspects and first can build towards that, but it's not only just uh, on, the, on the general aspect. I don't know, I'm gonna, uh, probably you're teaching on that, so I'll let you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was saying like FAIR is something fairly science specific, I would say, like where general software management processes uh, exist also in industry and in all other sorts of contexts. Um, yeah, and, and the fair, as you were saying, is something very specific that that comes now in. It should ideally, of course, be integrated then in scientific software management and development processes. But the the, the development in general is a bit broader. Yeah, but ideally, I mean, if we bring up our scientists and their programming and education, so probably we can kind of in the future ingrain this thinking that that the yeah the kind of fair software is not something that you think about at the end or i have the software now how do i make it fair but that you kind of like develop it in a fair way from the beginning and in, in part this already happens right because the version control is such an important part of that uh, so it's it's in it's anyway with the fair it's a quite new term that came up five years ago but many of the concepts have been much older if they have done but then this coining one really sexy term for it <laughs> has really uh, brought it a Very long way. Very catchy, yes. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, I think there's a raised hand from Albert. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, thank you, Leslie. Um, and thank you for the presentation, I mean, it was great. Um, I missed the first 10, 15 minutes or something, so apologies if I asked something that you already explained. But um, to me, software sounds like 
you know, uh, a package that you buy, um, Microsoft Word or whatever, right? Um, where numerical models are more like, you know, the toys that researchers make. So why uh, have you chosen to mention constantly software versus, you know, numerical models? Uh, is there a reason for that? Um and the reason, I mean, the, the difference that we discussed at the beginning was really like data versus software, right? Where they are different and where we have separate models. So that is indeed something we discussed in the beginning, but the, um, that you mentioned the point of models, that's actually an interesting one because also models, you have all this like trained machine learning models, for example. And then we had this discussion recently, yeah, are they actually data or software? So where do they belong? And that's not so clear. Yeah. So I, yeah. So I, I don't have a real answer to that, but uh, you, you really hit a point that this is a kind of thing that is put in in between. Yeah. Okay. If I can compliment on that, uh, we made the distinction on research software because while we were discussing on that, we explicitly leave out, let's say, Microsoft Excel, or you know the those tools that help you in your day to day activities. But do not enable research that is not conducting to to a publication or to see a patient eventually, for instance, in the, in the, in the health domain and so on and so forth. That is important. And then for the discussion about the models, I will claim that it's a digital object. <laughs> so you know, if you use an ontology, you say, well, it's a digital object. So let's apply one of another commonality from both the data and the software component. Yeah, so maybe like a fair models uh, is another another discussion that should be should be led by modeling experts. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Interesting question. Thank you. Uh, let's get to this other question. Okay, there's two more questions. I think we might be able to get to them if we are succinct. So, one question in the chat is: Should version control systems be a fair requirement for research software? I will, I will, I will start by that, and I will make the statement that fair to me as, is uh, aspirational. It's not like white, white and black. It's like you build and then you progressively uh, adopt uh, having a fair, a more fair software and so on and so forth. So I will for sure re require having a version control, but I will not make it explicit that has to be, you know. And, and if you remember one of the uh, Annalena's slides. What's a specific uh, mention about versioning for software? Because the version of software has many implications. And one uh, direct one is about when you want to reproduce your analysis or when you are doing benchmarking. You want to know which version, version you have used to do an analysis or which version you are benchmarking when you are comparing things. Because uh, differences between version can have a great impact in the, in the results that you are having, failing to reproduce or you know, to to compare ourselves. Thank you. And I'm going to try to rush us to this last question we have in the chat, which is, could you please talk a bit more about uh, software includes qualified references to other objects in the interoperable principle? Can you give some examples of what is a qualified reference? I mean, one, one simple example, I mean, it sounds very complicated and it can indeed, uh, if you look in the full semantic stack and in a semantic web thing, it can be very complicated, but one of the qualified references can already be a dependency to a library. Uh, so qualified means that's in a, in a structured and defined way and software, I mean, if you have Python scripts, for example, you have the imports in the beginning, that's already qualified like a reference to, to other software. That will be a very simple example. But that's already one thing that can be made to that, yeah. yeah. But the idea is that in the metadata, there can be even more that is really like linked data and semantic web content, and then it gets more complicated. So this is all meant by this term, but a very simple one is really just the, the, the imports that you do. Sounds like a whole nother webinar. <laughs> well, that is excellent. We are at time and I want to thank everyone for being here. But thank you presenters, thank you, uh, CSDMS members and thanks for the great discussion. This has been recorded and it will be posted on the CSDMS website. So I think all that's left is to say, see you at the next event and thanks. Have a great rest of your day, wherever you are in your, in your day today. <laughs>